I think we're going to get started now. It's awesome to see everybody here this morning, and just want to say good morning and uh, welcome to uh, NHGRI's uh, Social and Behavioral Research Branches Seminar Series. Our goal is to, twice a year to bring in scholars who are involved in innovative research at the intersection of social and behavioral sciences and health. And so this is our spring rendition of our seminar series, and it's really my great honor to introduce today our distinguished speaker, Dr. Joanna Mountain. I want to give you a little bit of background about uh, Joanna. Um, one of the things that I uh, learned about her um, in terms of her biography is that following completion of her bachelor's degree, Joanna spent two years in Kenya as a Peace Corps volunteer. And as I looked over um, her career trajectory since that time, it seems to me like that experience was really pivotal in terms of shaping her uh, scientific interests as well as her career path. Um, upon her return to the States, she completed her doctorate in um, genetics at Stanford University and then went off to, you know, a little bit um, fair distance to UC Berkeley um, to complete a postdoctoral fellowship at, uh, in integrative biology. Um, upon completion of her uh, postdoc, uh, she joined the faculty at Stanford University in anthropological sciences and genetics. And in 2007, she joined the leadership team at 23andMe as the senior research director, um, or senior director of research. There we go. Um, her efforts in this role are really focused on overseeing the ongoing research enterprise at 23andMe while ensuring protections of research participants who are engaged in, in that work. Um, recently, she's done some work with the PGIN team, um, and really the focus there is um, understanding how receipt of genetic test results impacts people's lives. Um, Dr. Mountain has co-authored and authored over 60 publications in the field of human genetics. And I think that she has really brought to this work her interest and experiences um, from the beginning in culture, linguistics, uh, genetic diversity in Africa. And I, um, I found this wonderful quote um, in her own words uh, where uh, that really describes, I think, her perspective in terms of her science, that each tiny segment of the genome has a history. Um, so with this, um, she's played a key role in the discovery uh, in discoveries related to genetic variation and ancestry. And I'd like to ask you all to give a warm welcome to Dr. Mountain as she's going to share with us today some of the research priorities at 23andMe in customer-powered research. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, yeah, I was actually going to start out by saying a little bit about my his personal history anyway, because I didn't really become a scientist till I was in my 20s. I, um, before that, I was really interested in international studies. So it all kind of came together, but I, the, 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 you know, the scientific thinking didn't come up until, you know, not that recently, but relatively recently. Um, and, but I've become pretty much a scientist, and like many other scientists I work with today, sometimes we can be bigger thinkers, sometimes but we're very focused. And I'm fortunate to be complimented at 23andMe by our CEO and founder, Ann Wojcicki, who thinks bigger. She thinks big at all times. And the title here, Customer Powered Research, kind of gets to her thinking big. You know, where you don't just sort of say, I'm going to do a study of one condition and gather data for a thousand people with that condition and a thousand people without. I'm going to do a, something where those thousand people and many thousands more get something back. And we're going to make, create some, an engine that powers research, but it also benefits people much more broadly. So I've had the benefit of working with someone who thinks big like that and being part of this infrastructure that I think is very powerful and I'm excited to talk about today. Um, so 
I'll give a little bit of background on our mission and the service we provide, and then jump into the customer-powered research. Um, so our stated mission, and we've stuck with this for years, which is one reason I've stuck with 23andMe, is to you know, give people access to their genome, per personal genetic data, you know, enable them to understand, help them understand the genome, and enable them to benefit from the genome. So they're all pretty lofty goals. And even providing access to personal genetic information was a huge challenge. And for me, at first, I was like, that's the big challenge. Enabling people to understand that information and benefit from it was sort of too much for me to think about. But we've actually made some progress, I believe, in the last 10 years since 23andMe launched. So. We have a bunch of sort of core beliefs at the company, and I'm proud to share those beliefs with hundreds of my fellow 23andMe employees. We're growing rapidly, and, and, and it makes a huge difference when you have that, this sort of shared set of beliefs about you know, you know, the right to access personal genetic information, the power of personalized medicine, at least potentially, and you know, supporting people as they make decisions around health, and you know, working to you know, accelerate research and you know, thereby benefit people indirectly. Um, so we have um, our, our process for getting genetic information to people. You know, starts out with a little box. And you know, people order that box. They get a tube. I think they're freaked out by it. It sort of seems kind of science-y, because you have to spit in the tube and then mix the buffer in, like it's, it's sort of overwhelming to some people, like they, how can I do this sort of science-y thing? I've never done this before. So it's, it's an introduction to you know, how to you know, follow the instructions, and we try to make those clear. But people manage most, I mean, five million people have managed to do it with our kit. And they send that box back in with the saliva sample, and then at some point they're invited to open up their account and learn things about themselves. So the things they learn about are based on our reports we provide. And it's an ongoing, we continue to add new reports, seven reports around genetic health risk. Oh, wrong button. Um, we actually, our first, um, um, case where the FDA allowed us to market was for carrier status reports. We have over 40 of those now. And, and you know, ancestry reports have been something I'm very focused on. And we are really making efforts in the areas of wellness and traits where we can actually use data from our customers to put out um, new reports. So this um, is something, so for some examples, it, it turns out that information about Alzheimer's was something that so many people really kind of asked for, requested again and again. We want to know, do we have any higher than average risk for Alzheimer's? And so this is you know, the, uh, a report based on the APOE variants associated with late onset Alzheimer's. We don't have any reports on the early onset genes. Um, you know, for a sample trait report, you know, eye color I see these reports often, you know, hair color, eye color, freckling, um, as a, an opportunity for people to learn a little bit about genetics. They often will see that it doesn't match what they, I, I like, I get less likely to freckle, less likely than average to freckle. I'm like, what? <laughs> you didn't see me when I was 12, full, just fully covered with freckles. So what's going on here? So. It gives people a little bit of skepticism, which I think is you know, really important to be a little bit skeptical about what you're seeing here. And that is a, an important part of the education that we provide. And people get to dig in as deeply as they want to the details. Around ancestry, we have, you know, this is sort of our core um, feature where we, you know, people just crave to, they, particularly want to know their proportions of ancestry from different parts of the world. And they want lots of detail, as far as we can tell. And so this is one of my colleagues who has ancestry from many parts of the world. Um, 
certainly some from Europe, which is the blue stripes. Um, and, you know, the yellow indicates from um, Asia and or native, the Americas, and the red indicates some ancestry from Africa. So this individual identifies as Latina, and that is sort of consistent with this geography that we see in her genome. So this is, you know, sort of just one example of what people get back when they sign up for the service. Now, at the same time, and I actually just got this invitation yesterday, because I have about 10 different 23andMe accounts, because I'm always being a tester, spitting and spitting and, you know, getting, testing the new versions. So I, yesterday, I got yet one more invitation to answer a survey. And so our research platform is something that people are made familiar with pretty soon after they, they sign up. And so the idea is that we take our customers, we have the genetic information that they benefit from, and then they provide a survey responses, and we combine those to make discoveries. Um, now, this is kind of key. We think a great deal about how to make this um, not just palatable to people, but you know, give them confidence and trust in our research platform. So it's always opt-in. People not only consent to be part of our research program at its own overall level, but each question or survey is a choice. Do I answer this or do I skip it? And so that, that's the opt-in piece. We, have, we do have a very broad IRB protocol, and the consent is broad, which was something a little bit challenging at first. But I think you know, we've you know, iterated, and you know, it works, seems to work very well. We've done a few um, small studies to get um, an understanding of our, our customers' understanding of the consent form, which is you know, challenging, then our IRB encourage us to, encourages us to do that. And it, it, from what we hear in you know, telephone interviews, our customers tend to trust us, and they actually they think we're doing more sharing of their data than we actually do. So we're actually more conservative than people actually expect of us. Um, they can choose not to cease participating, to change their consent status at any time. And once we, we typically aggregate data from many, many customers, thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands, put that together and publish the aggregated, the summary statistics rather than, and certainly none of the individual level data, though we do have in some cases asked people, can, may we share your individual level data with uh, a collaborator? So that is not unprecedented, and we, but we have to do an extra level of consent for that. Um, so from the beginning, we have believed that um, online research with the access to the internet you know, the participation is fairly easy. Where's my phone? It's not in my pocket for some reason. Um, it's right there. But meaning, I, if I'm at the train station, I can open up the mobile 23andMe app, start answering questions while I'm waiting for the train. You know, instead of looking at Facebook, I'm contributing to research. So, you know, that participation, we're always trying to make it easier and easier. And the mobile app is one big push we're making on that front. Geography is not a barrier. People can participate from anywhere in the world. You know, if I travel, wherever I travel, as long as I have internet access, I can participate. Um, and the final point here is that, you know, I, I have been told I've participated in at least 60 studies, 23andMe studies myself. And everyone is typically participating in multiple studies and actually contributing to multiple published papers. My son the other day, because he signed up again, he's like, I've done more surveys than 37% of the customers. He was so excited, and which is, I would, of course, love to see that. He doesn't really express enthusiasm for my career very often. <laughs> so that was good. But, you know, seeing that, that's the reaction we hope for. Um, so at this point, we have over 5 million customers. And of those 5 million, roughly 80% have consented to be part of our research program. That doesn't mean they've all answered a, a survey or a question, though many of them have. You know, 
at least you know, 75% of those have answered at least one survey, which means we have over a billion questions answered, which is kind of mind boggling. But you know, we're in Silicon Valley and numbers are, are what we care about. All right, so demographics has been something we've tracked over time, been relatively consistent, and especially in, you know, in terms of male, female, usually very, very close to 50% male, 50% female. The um, proportion of customers who have mostly European ancestry is you know, over 75%, but, and that's been true also over time, though there was a time in 2010 when the fraction of customers who identified as African-American was closer to 1%. We uh, launched a program to, it's called Roots into the Future that um, invited African-Americans to sign up. And we, um, for that program, we sent out 10,000 kits and that really seeded the growth of that portion of the cohort. And we're looking for ways to, you know, change that and do, do the same for the rest of the world. A big part of what I think about. So um, I've just brought this up. Um, pretty early on in the history of 23andMe, we launched our first major research initiative, focused initiative. And this, the goal was to enroll 10,000 individuals with Parkinson's disease in 23andMe, have them take surveys. So we launched in March of 2009, pretty early on. And as, as of now, we have well over 11,000 participants who have a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. And that's very, very powerful because we can do surveys, you know, follow people's pro, you know, progression over time and really do some, a lot of research and get that published. You know, Parkinson's disease was that first focus initiative, but we have a number of others launched since then, several more, much more recently, enrolling, you know, 5,000, 10,000, and we're, you know, over 25,000 people with either major depressive disorder or bipolar disorder. And that was launched actually quite recently. So that's, you know, a lot of what I do. We also have, um, um, as of a couple of years, three years ago, we have a therapeutics division led by Richard Scheller, who's really focused on the power of Genetics, and we actually did some of our own research to show that if you look at drugs that have been successful, the ones that have a human genetics, you know, sort of evidence that they might be successful are, you know, much more likely to be to succeed. So we've been able to sort of back do that analysis um, and you know show the power of genetics in developing therapeutics. Um, Wellness research is kind of an, a thing we've been working on at least, you know, you know, throughout, but certainly the last couple of years. And so this is, um, uh, I don't know if the, I'm trying to remember if I got invited to this. Um, you know, a subset of customers, um, it may have been based on at BMI. And I said, so that's why I think I should have been, because it turns out the BMI of 25 is, you know, I've, never been that uncomfortable with it, but you know, it is the sort of a cutoff where people start giving it labels. And we've invited, you know, people who um, might be interested in weight loss to do a, a, a longitudinal participation and and they are tracked into um, um, various cohorts and invited to do an exercise program or a dietary program for weight loss. And so the the goal here, and this is led by my colleague, Liana Del Gobo, who says that, you know, she's very, very, you know, interested in finding out if there's any genetic architecture underlying the people's ability to lose weight and what factors are relevant there. And we may be able to do it if we get hundreds of thousands of people to participate in a study like this. So that's one, one track on our research, wellness research. Um, so so we, when we get this engagement, you know, draw people into these studies, either the focused ones like Parkinson's or, well, or the weight loss, or just generally questions about freckling or handedness or motion sickness. Um, we make a lot of discoveries. So each person, 
you know, participates in an average of 200 studies when we go down into the details. And so this is the official slide, 90 plus papers published to date, but at 416, so that's two days ago, I got an email saying we, we have reached our 100th publication, which I'm super proud of. And, and this is just a, a little, we have a, a nice page that went up recently that um, shows the list of publications and the different colored boxes there show the areas, including psychiatry, behavior, methodology, traits, immunity, and reproduction. So all these, and there's an LC paper in here too. So we have papers coming out in all kinds of areas and these are each powered by 23andMe customers. Many of these are collaborations because we don't have the domain expertise in-house for everything. And so we need to reach, or we don't, we benefit from people reaching out to us and us reaching out to others to team up on you know, studies, for instance, on autism, schizophrenia, and anorexia nervosa. That is done in collaboration because you know, others have much more expertise than we do in that domain. So just to go into a paper that I was particularly fond of, um, as someone with myopia, and um, this, with a simple question, we had multiple questions in the end, but it started out with the core question being, did you wear glasses before the age of 10? And if I ask in this room, how many people wore glasses before the age of 10 besides me? There are people tend to, I was excited to see, people tend to remember, I know it was like second or third grade. So you kind of remember people, or you can ask your mother, or you know, someone remembers when you started wearing glasses. And that simple question enabled us to sort of say the cases were the people who wore glasses early and the controls were people who did not. And that simple question led us to discover, you know, like you know, over 20 genetic variants uh, associated with myopia. And the cool thing was these were not just, you know, scattered randomly throughout the genome. They tended to be in genes that were linked to these, the visual cycle and seemed to be biologically relevant from, for myopia. And we thought that was very validating. And this is just a Manhattan plot of those genes across the genome. Um, so motion sickness, again, I was interested in this one. And again, you see the biology. Once you get the genetic variants out, you see that it's relevant that, that the genes that are discovered are around neurological processes and inner ear development, which makes sense given the, the subject matter. And this paper, pretty much mostly 23andMe scientists, um, which is true of a, a number of our papers, but certainly not all of them. The ancestry research um, is ongoing. This is a paper published, uh, led by my colleague, Kasha Britz, who dug into our database because we have people, we asked people in our customer base, and we did not used to do this. We only started asking about your sort of racial or ethnic identity maybe six or eight years ago because NIH kept saying, you need to tell us how many people you have in these bins. And the IRB was also pushing us. So we had these sort of reasons, non-research reasons to ask these questions. And some people were really kind of unhappy with us. Why are you asking us this? You know, you know the wonderful skeptical 23andMe customer wants to know why. But we, and so we could rep reply and say, we need this to do our annual reports to various entities. And so we did get information about people who identifies as African-American, Latino, and European-American. And so this is really, customers from the US driving this research. And we could, so this is just part of a blog post. So one thing we do with almost all of our papers is put out a blog post, which is a little bit more easy to digest for anybody, customer or otherwise. And here we are in this piece, we're highlighting the part of the study that um, looked at Native American ancestry in Latinos and how that differed across the US. And nobody is that surprised to see that in the states bordering Mexico, you see much more native, what's called indigenous American ancestry. 
or Native American ancestry. Um, you know, if you look at um, African Americans and look at um, on the upper in upper left, you see the uh, the average African ancestry of African Americans across the states. Upper right, the Native American ancestry in African Americans. Lower left is the European ancestry in African Americans, and how that varies. So you, people got to sort of see themselves. You know, you sort of look at your own state and go, okay, does this make sense to me from what I know? And that. So what was fascinating was that, and we also took, went a little bit more detail looking at the country level. You know, how much Italian ancestry do people appear to have in different states in Scandinavian? So, and this article was fascinating to me because when you look at the Twitter impact, you know, of everyone who tweeted about this paper, members of the public who are not identified as scientists, 64%. So a lot of the impact was for the public or customers. So people were going and looking at the paper. Now, you know, we heard from the very beginning that if, you, if the paper is not open access, Nobody's going to pay that $30 just to look at a scientific paper. But if it's open access, it seems like you know thousands of customers are actually going to take a look at the paper. Now, they may not go and look at every detail, but they may, if they want to go more deeply than we do in our service, they can do so because of our policy of publishing in open access papers, open access journals. Um, and so this is sort of the... the um, media impact of that paper. You know, many people picked it up, which means that the, the story goes more wide than, it, than just our customers. And they may not go into the paper and see this particular figure, which is fascinating, and you can stare at it. I, we've stared at it for hours. And each circle is a pie chart. And, you know, you look at a particular proportion of, of African ancestry and Native American ancestry, and you ask, how do those people identify? So this here, roughly 40% African ancestry and say 16% Native American ancestry, you have um, maybe a quarter of the people identifying as European American and three quarters identifying as Latino. So this story here is that the proportion of your ancestry as estimated by genetics is not at all tightly correlated with how you self-identify. And that's a message that I think is fascinating and some of our customers actually focused on. All right, so that gets to something that's you know core to what I think about. And this is how we broaden out the data that we have either you know, for customers or other approaches. And you know, we have two reasons to expand the diversity of our data sets. Um, one is that we can do research, I mean, as many of you may have seen, there was a paper by um, Popejoy and Fullerton that, that you know, highlighted the fact that of genetics research papers and publications, participants, 81% of participants seem to have European ancestry. And that is something that has been found not just recently, but over time. And the 81% is actually much better than the previous summary that suggested it was about 94% European participants. So we want to do something to kind of you know, move that needle. Um, um, so that, in general, in terms of research. But also, we want to improve the, the service we provide to customers by having more diverse uh, reference data in, for let's say, our ancestry features. Um, and we've um, done some analyses to sort of get at how many samples we need from each population in order to be able to tell someone you're more likely to have ancestry from population A or B. And it's roughly 500 individuals, 1,000 haplotypes, which is where you end up kind of getting high probability of accuracy um, in your inference. So, so we that's and so recently in February, we launched a sort of an expansion of a previous project we had we called the African Genetics Project. This is we went global and we started inviting people from um, 60 countries from around the world to sign up for 23andMe. You know the idea was if you live in the U.S., 
and you are from this country, or even your parents were from a particular one of these countries, you can sign up, get access to 23andMe's service, and you know, support our research. So we're actually expecting to enroll you know, thousands of individuals over the next year or two. And we've already reached you know, over a couple thousand, and that's been exciting in a relatively short period of time. And so this is one way, you know, because we have this sort of give and take model where people can, you know, get something. And we, you know, sometimes you ask, well, if someone knows they're from, let's say, Ghana, why would they sign up to find out? It, there are, and I've even seen this written about people who are from Africa actually interested in helping other people know where they're from. So sometimes it's, um, it's, a, it's a generous act. Yeah. So, and we, um, this is even an even more re recent initiative we launched, where we are supporting researchers who are going out in the field, as I did, you know, 20 years ago, and, you know, working with populations around the world. We're working with a couple of PIs in the Americas, uh, one or two in Africa, and we'll support the genotyping component of their research and maybe provide some additional support. And that's something that, um, so the idea is, um, you know, 23andMe sends the, the collection kits to the researcher who, you know, goes to the population, you know, and, you know, so this is the steps. This is sort of information for a prospective collaborator. And then, so we have done some of these collaborations, you know, we've done over the years, but there've been one-off efforts and they've been very successful, we'd like to scale that up so we can really reach out and support more researchers from around the world. Because they're the ones, again, like our health domain experts, these are population experts we want to team up with. We look forward to doing that over the next few years. And this, actually, it's, this is an expansion of a previous program called our Academic Collaborations Program where we receive submissions every year from dozens of researchers saying, I would like to do a study with you on, let's say, motion sickness or anorexia or psychiatry. And may we replicate our results or attempt to in your database, or may we team up and do a meta-analysis. So we've done that, you know, dozens of times. We supported um, dozens of pro projects that way and this is an expansion to focus not just on conditions, health conditions and traits, but on population diversity. So that's you know, one thing I'm very um, proud of. And we're, this is our, our sort of our timeline over the next year for this populations collaboration program and our global genetics project. So we've, we kind of have this, working for a company is quite fascinating because you, you are constantly iterating on your goals and like, okay, these were my goals yesterday. I might, are they still my goals? It's really kind of teething on top of things, which I have come to appreciate over the years. I didn't appreciate it at first. I was like, what, you want me to commit to something? You're right, you know, outside of a grant? Yeah, so, um, so we believe that this research participation benefits not just the world through publications or our service, but that people get direct rewards. Um, and so we make discoveries, share those with our customer, and thereby we hope to develop a, a cohort of you know, educated and engaged consumers um, over time. And one way is that we you know, make the publications, we publish in open access journals, or we you know, publish, you know, pay that extra to make a, a paper open access. And our customers are actually quite interested, you know, you know, with, you know, for in, you know, with the prevalence of depression being very high, we have, you know, customers who might want to go and look at this paper in Nature Genetics. So that's sort of for the expert customer who wants to dig deep. We may um, and you know we have, but even so certainly Researchers, you know, finding out that, that this is a paper indicating that variants um, associated with prion disease 
are not nearly as pathogenic as previously had been thought. And, you know, that prognoses for ha having particular variants were not nearly as severe as had been considered. And that we also, this paper also gives therapeutic clues. So this is a very indirect way to benefit consumers where the, the paper may, you know, change prognoses and the, and therapeutics research. Um, a little bit more directly, we often publish a blog post in order to get the word out about a paper. You know, a headline about motion, morning sickness. You know, many, it's sort of in the news all the time now because of, um, I can't remember who's, which person in People Magazine has been, okay, right, so, yeah. Right, so it's in the news, so we publish a paper, it gets the attention and people learn a little bit more about genetics by reading the blog post. And, and so, so you look on the left here, and that's the more serious paper for anyone who wants the details, published very recently, just last month. On the right side, you have a friendlier, easier to access or easier to read summary of the story written by one of our writers. We've been fortunate to have writers coming in from journalism where, you know, your journalists are having a harder time sticking with newspapers these days. You know, we fortunately have benefited from acquiring, you know, bringing in writers who, who can write that in a way that's accessible to the public. Um, so something more direct, there's a little button you can push if you click far enough you get to a, a page that tells you how many publications your data were contributed to. Mine is up to 62 for one of my accounts. And so then I find out which papers were there. Um, I am a control for the morning sickness story, I know. And I, oh, so the genetics of empathy was um, around a reading the mind in the eyes survey, which is a, I think a validated survey that we used, and boy, that is a challenging survey. But I just, I don't know how, whether I was a case or control in that, where I fit in the spectrum on the genetics of empathy or the empathy spectrum. But anyway, it's fascinating, it was fascinating for me the first time I looked at this, like, wow, how did I fit into each of these studies? And I could scroll down and look at all 62 of them. So that's a more direct reward of research participation. Um, we also provide lots sort of um, mini reports that, um, you know, this um, is about morning, whether I'm a morning person or not. And, and this, and it's very clear that it's because of my age. I mean, not, you know, just my genetics, but, you know, genetics combined with age contribute to this sort of suggestion that I'm more likely to be a, a morning person. And I'm, I think I may be, I mean, it's still pretty early for me. It's only 7.30 for me. So feeling kind of like a morning person right now. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to wrap up there and take questions. But I have to thank all these, you know, millions, basically, of people who are participating in our research and the, my colleagues across the company, not just in our research team, but people all over the company have to contribute to building this infrastructure to conduct this research. And it's an amazing team. And I have to acknowledge all that. So happy to take questions, but I understand that we need to use the microphone over there. Hey, Joanna, thanks Hi. for coming. That's a great talk. Um, I'm curious uh, what the sort of push from the consumers are uh, to get results back. And I mean, from, from their research, it's mm -hmm. a pretty obvious question. You guys are good at giving results back. And is, how do you deal with that or resist it or address yeah. it? Um, so, so there's sort of, I think there are multiple questions in there. There's, you know, what are the, you know, if, you know, if we're doing this, all this research, what is happening to all this data that I'm giving you? What is, there's, I think there's a sense amongst our customers like we want to know that you're being responsible about you know what and and not just leaving it sitting there and so we do our best so you know 
you know, six or seven years ago, we felt like we can't actually do all the research. We can't make, take advantage of this amazing database fully enough, which is when we launched the academic collaborations program, we thought, well, why don't we team up with outside academics to conduct the research and extract more from the database? And it does end up going into publications. And once those are out there, we can either do this sort of, you know, mini research summary in, or we can do a blog post. So though it's changed over time, you know, with the FDA sort of looking, scrutinizing everything we do, our ability to provide reports is, has changed a little bit. But we find ways to at least give people the sense that we are, you know, actually conducting the research and making use of the, the data they're providing. So... Hi, I came in a little late, so I apologize if you already mentioned this, but one of the criticisms of the health reports in particular is that they focus only on single genetic variants. And I'm wondering whether, whether you folks are looking into more complex models, polygenic risk scores, models mm -hmm. that might include other non-genetic predictors in coming mm -hmm. up with more accurate uh, uh, predictions mm -hmm. of health mm -hmm. outcomes. Yeah, so I hopefully that question was clear. Um, about going beyond, you know, more simple genetic models to polygenic models. And that is very much a part of our, you know, genetic health risk. We, it's been um, um, a challenge to um, sort of convince the world that we're doing that. We have to convince the world that, that if you go to a more complex model, that consumers will understand that. And, but from everything I've seen, you know, when the, with the personal genomics PGEN project, people get the fact that genetics isn't everything. And that is one of our big messages, that there are other factors. Just like I showed you, age and genetics has, it gives, me a, gives an indication of my likelihood of being a morning person. And so we, it's a theme that comes out throughout our reports. And we certainly are doing a lot around polygenic risk scores. We have a health research and development team that is very you know, focused on that and using machine learning approaches to come up with new models. And we're starting a lot with traits because those seem to be, and we've often used traits as a way to kind of get going in presenting customers with the results because they're less, you know, worrisome. And so we have a number of traits where we're using the polygenic risk scores and moving towards bringing in non-genetic factors as well, which we think is absolutely essential. I've got two questions. One is what IRB do you use? So the IRB we, we use and have used since the beginning is um, ENI, Ethical and Independent, Ethical and Independent Review Services. They, they have two locations, one in California and one in the Midwest. And so they, um, we, um, we first, thought about using an IRB, when I started, there had been some discussions between our founders and an IRB, and it wasn't going well. So I reached out to a local IRB, the California one, and explained our situation. So we haven't, we're, we need help. And the, the person I spoke to, contact, said, well, the first thing you have to do is separate your consent form from your terms of service. You can't package them all together. Those have to be two independent decisions. And so we did that right away. And that at that point, the IAB started getting comfortable with advising us as we proceeded. And it's been, you know, very much a collaborative effort. And we have, I don't know, many protocols. We do modifications on a regular basis as we make changes. You know, for instance, you introduce a mobile app, and all of a sudden you need, we need to get them to review how we do things on mobile. And so as we get more and more complex in our project here, the IRB has to keep up. So it's my role is to review all our submissions and try to make sure that, they, that the IRB team can even understand what the heck we're doing because it's so complex. And, but we've been fortunate that that pair of IRBs that has been willing to take the time to understand what we're doing and, and watch it as it's grown in complexity. 
My other question is, how valid is self-reported disease data, and is it more valid in a population that chooses to do this kind of a test? I don't know if that was clear. The question is, how valid is the self-reported disease information? And we've done a number of you know, studies to try to check that validity. The first one was to look at how well could we replicate um, GWAS findings that had been done previously, and we found that we were, had a lot of success replicating. So if we could sort of, the, the quality of the self-reported data was good enough for GWAS, we found, because we were able to replicate in most areas, though in around psychiatry, it was more challenging. We didn't replicate as, but nobody was having much success with GWAS anyway, until we got to models that have, you know, hundreds or thousands of genes and variants. So, so that was your first question. And the second one was... It's more valid in the population. Right. So what, we have a non-representative fragment of the U.S. population. Are they better able, in a better position for some reason, to report accurately their health status for any given condition? And that may be the case, and that may be that mean that the results we provide are most valid in a similar population. But we can look at that. We can look at, we can bring in to, you know, into a, take into account other non-genetic factors, socioeconomic factors, and so on, and kind of examine that and check to see if it's consistent across those cohorts. Mm -hmm. Hi, I also have two questions. My first is with your um, the global diversity yes. uh, outreach. How are you, or is there validation for um, customers that say they're from a certain huh. country or their right. parents came from a certain country? Hmm. And, yes, yeah. so that's an important question now. I have come to trust people more over, the, over time, partly because when we first did, um, you know, we enrolled 10,000 African-Americans by basically asking, you know, if you identify as African American, you know, here's a kit and sign up and, you know, take this survey and so on. And, you know, we were able to look, you know, and at, you know, we would also ask people again the same question later on. And if people are consistent over time in how they self report their identity or ancestry, that gives us confidence. If we look at the genetics, we also have a sort of a sense from averages over you know, or even, you know, smaller data sets and, and published data, what we expect for people, a cohort who identifies as Latino or African-American, we, we kind of have a sense, we can look at the genetic data and say, well, our expectation is that the average for this cohort would be about, say, 80% African, 20% European, and so on. So we can kind of evaluate at least at an aggregate level and because of those have really met our expectations in all, all ways. And when we recruited people from Africa, we looked at their genomes and really not everyone looked like they had 100% of their genome from Africa. That's not surprising given the history of Africa that you're gonna find some people who, who have all four grandparents from Africa, but the fact that they have a great grandparent or great great grandparent who's from some part of Europe is not that un unusual. So, so we have ways of, and then we can, you know, again, ask for more detail about that ancestry later on. So we basically do it by looking at the genetic data, but also asking the same questions a couple of times and seeing if we get consistent answers. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, my second question is with your academic collaborations. Mm -hmm. Is there any bridge towards the public health kind of sector and mm -hmm. um, that population level? Uh, medicine instead hmm. of just the individualized stuff. Right. So I did emphasize the academic piece. Public health wise, I think, again, we tend to work with academics, you know, like working with Robert Greene um, on the PGEN project to look at. But that's not really, it's really, it's more social science, but not public health. And we have, um, had conversations with people focused on public health and you know with the CDC, for instance, but we haven't actually teamed up that directly. Which and it, so that seems to be an opportunity for us. There are so many opportunities out there, and we haven't really gone in every single direction yet. So I don't trust us not to go in every single direction. It's maybe in our future. 
Um, you had a slide talking about global partnerships for population genetics, and it sounds like the data that are submitted by those partners go straight back to their researchers. Mm -hmm. So the those accounts are handled differently than other accounts. Right. I guess, is there any right. thought that those participants would actually gain access okay. to their data the same way that a... Yeah, so we, the previous projects we've done that are population focused um, have been where the, the researcher gets the data back and the participants often, we hope, get something else back. Either, say, support for a student to get education or, or some kind of, you know, results back, which is a really tricky thing to figure out. It's sort of, you have to do that on a case-by-case -case basis. We have another model that we've used in the U.S. where a research is conducted, and this was done in Nevada, where the researcher signs up, you know, a hundred or thousands of people, and each of those individuals gets an account. So we have a model, and we are, you know, in a position to do that kind of model with a researcher, say, working in a country where people have internet access and you know where the researchers or local public health officials think that there would be some ben benefit or value to the participants of getting that access which so that again is on a case by case basis and we so we've had discussions with researchers who think yes these participants are absolutely they're educated they're in this research program because they're you know interested in their health we think they could benefit from access so we and we have a pipeline to make that work so Yes, definitely in the model. Mm -hmm. so I was wondering about your genotyping technology that mm -hmm. you've used. It's evolved over the time that you've been mm -hmm. using it. What, how have you managed the different technologies, assuming you've used more than one? Okay, so genotyping technology. We've actually been very consistent in always using an Illumina array. And that array itself has evolved over time. But So that's, you know, you know as it changes... We have to update everything we do, pretty much. We have, or we have to check and make sure that all the algorithms for that link a person's genome genomic data to a report work function properly. And we have a whole team of people who are dedicated to that. Yeah. Okay. So great. And I was just wondering, will you ever evolve to moving to uh, whole genome sequencing? And mm -hmm. that is a topic of conversation quite regularly. So we keep an eye on a couple of things. Basically, the the cost of the whole genome, or you know, you know, targeted or whatever it is, sequencing, and then the accuracy. You know, the genotype array technology we started with because it was so robust, and to go from there to something that we really trust and our customers trust to something that is not as solid would be that would hurt me. So we haven't made that leap yet, but so we're keeping an eye on where things stand in terms of cost, because cost is a huge factor for consumers and accuracy. So we're watching that closely. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Joanna, for that presentation. Um, so you mentioned that 23andMe is increasing its efforts to diversify its data. and. Usually, or ideally, when we talk about data diversification, um, it goes hand in hand with like increasing um, engagements with communities that have been like historically disadvantaged and um, exploited by like scientific research. Mm -hmm. And so, my question is specifically for tribal communities and indigenous populations, and how Twenty Three Me is engaging with them mm -hmm. when trying to be more inclusive versus mm -hmm. just drawing inferences from existing mm -hmm. consumer mm -hmm. databases. So that is a challenging question. That's I mean, it's a, it's a topic of discussion amongst a number of people at 23andMe. We recently had a speaker come in. I don't know if you know Kalu Fox. He's at, in San Diego, and his whole point is that if you're going to study these communities, you need to have a representative from that community actually helping conduct the research, not just conversations, but actually engaged in the conduct of the research. And that stimulated me to sort of go beyond where we had even been going before, which is how do we actually have, you know, direct communication with members of a community, but how do we identify an individual within the community to be kind of an advisor? So it's really, um, I mean, and by teaming up with um, researchers who already have that, you know, sort of communication and engagement with a community, we think we can get started in that. 
because we may not have, I have um, links to some communities in South Africa and Tanzania, but not the rest of the world. But so we team up with others who do have those, you know, relationships with members of communities and that way. But I think we can go further with this, but it's not going to work for every community. Not every community has somebody who has the education to be um, a research partner. And in which case, maybe we can support the educational efforts. And we have plans to do that with one of the collaborations where we support a, a student going from a particular country to the UK to get a master's degree, return to their home country and be an expert in not necessarily genetics, but and in a position to be an educator. And so it's super challenging if you have the stringent requirement that you have to have a member of the community as part of your research team, because how to identify that person and is not something we've, you know, totally figured out, but it's certainly on our minds. And if you want, I can introduce you to Kalu Fox is this is his whole focus in life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So there's a question here and then in the front. Mm -hmm. Is the data that you provide back to your customer considered part of their medical health record? And so I guess maybe with, um, for life insurance companies. Mm -hmm. So if I apply, they often will require that you release information. Mm -hmm. And if I didn't do that, would that invalidate my policy? Um, so um, the data we provide is you know, personal and everyone gets their individual access. It does, certainly doesn't go directly into a medical record without us requesting your permission. Um, in terms of insurance, um, the GINA, Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act policy, provides protection in the areas of employment and um, health insurance, but not all areas of insurance. So, you know, we've been watching that, um, um, the negotiations around GINA to see if that's going to evolve, to broaden out to life insurance and so on. So it's, uh, I don't, I'm not an expert in that area. It's something that um, is, I'm sure, debated in among, in some corners, but it's something that we have to, you know, kind of, kind of keep, not me, people in 23Me have to keep an eye on. So we, you know, certainly support measures like GINA that do protect consumers as they gain access to this information. Mm -hmm. So what information do I get when I put my saliva in the test tube and send it to you? So, so... And um, how long does it take? All right, so the information you get, I mean, is going to be around your... Um, 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 your risk for particular conditions, and it's dozens of conditions, um, and then some information about you know what your genome says about your ancestry, and maybe you know some of your traits, um, eye color, and um, what a, there's dozens of traits we've looked at, and you know hair type and so on. So many many reports, and what we the hope is that. Um, you, there will be something there that is novel for you that you'll you know, learn something from the reports we provide and maybe not from every report because some of them won't be as relevant to you but you know something in there will be novel and interesting and engaging and you'll learn about yourself and about some genetics and so there's there's a lot to learn and everyone finds some people actually discover new relatives that they didn't know before so it goes from discovering, you know, the genetics of eye color to discovering a half sibling you didn't know about, or a half uncle you didn't know about, which is happening quite often. I keep hearing more and more stories, and certainly, even in, in the employees of Twenty Three Me are making discoveries. And that's so we have the whole company is made up of people who are learning about themselves through genetics. So we are very sensitive to the things people might learn. Mm -hmm. yeah, but you did not answer the question. How long does it take? Uh... Oh, so how long does it take? So, so you send in your sample. Well, you sign up. It takes a few days for the kit to get to your door. And then when you send the sample back, it's a matter of weeks. Anything, I don't know the time now. It's probably between two and four weeks. 
It depends on the time of year. So best to submit your sample in the summer. <laughs> right. Christmas time gets really crazy at the lab. Yeah. So what is the complete, is it the comprehensive genome database you provide from the GWS studies? Hmm. Is it related to NSACHI? Is it related to public? I mean, all my hmm. health and disease? Yes, it's everything. You get everything in, but in on your your account. So you go into, you log into an account. You get all kinds of reports, and you get to choose which reports you look at, right? And so, but it's not the whole genome that we study. We study around half a million positions in the genome that are known to be informative, right? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Welcome. I think we're. And thank you for your questions. Thank you. Thank you. I think we'll stay up here.